You're listening to Country Music Success Stories featuring Music City mentor J.C. Don Valeris. Now, here's your host, Candy O'Terry. Get ready, because you're about to hear the success story of a woman whose songs have been played on radio more than 12 million times, and counting, with estimated downloads at about 20 million. Karen Staley is her name, and she wrote Take Me As I Am and Hey Baby Let's Go to Vegas for Faith Hill and Keeper of the Stars for Tracy Bird. In fact, I think she's written about a thousand songs so far in her career. She's a gifted singer, a producer, and a self-taught guitar player who doesn't read music. But that didn't stop her from touring and singing backup for Faith, Terry Clark, Patty Loveless, and a very famous redhead. I got a call in my apartment. And she goes, hey, this is Reba. And I hung up on her because I thought it was someone jacking with me. And so she calls back. She goes, no, no, it's really Reba. She goes, what are you doing? I went, uh, eking out an existence. <laughs> she says, you want to go to the road with me? And I went, okay. Can you believe that? Hanging up on Reba McIntyre? Thank God Reba called back. What a story. And Karen's got many more stories to tell. As we settled into her incredible music room at her home, I spied guitars waiting to be played and gold records lining every inch of the walls. Karen offered JC and me some snacks. She made us laugh. She spoke from the heart about her incredible career in country music. Are you ready? Come on with us. Here we go. Did you always know that music was going to be part of your life? I did not. I always loved music. People don't know I'm introverted because I do comedy and stuff and around people that I'm comfortable with I can be you know just way out there but I was just terrible terrible stage fright and then I started out doing sports and stuff and never even thought of you know anything else and then I hurt my back my senior year of high school and my music teacher at the time was so sweet she could tell I was just kind of floundering with my time yeah and she gave me her guitar and taught me the chords to Annie song by John Denver and I never put the song down but this is a weird thing. And I saw this on Facebook. It says, whatever was the number one song on the day you were 14 will alter your life. And it was a- Annie's song. I got to go and look that up. That's that unbelievable. <laughs> so you're at the height of your career, but everybody has to start someplace. Yeah. Did you always know that this is what you would do? I grew up in that perfect time when there was all the singer-songwriters, James Taylor, Linda Ronstadt. Oh, she's and, my idol. Uh, oh, man. Oh. And Carly Simon yeah. and Cat Stevens and the Eagles and just all that, you know, the variety of stuff. But I really, even though I grew up in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, I really learned more of the country stuff through them because I kind of had a chip on my shoulder about country. I thought it was, you know, beneath me or something like that. I don't know why. And I remember I was singing Crazy by Linda Ronstadt and I had this older uh, piano player. He was probably, you know, I was like, 18 and he was 60 and he goes you ought to hear patsy klein sing it and i went patsy klein how could she sing better when it runs that <laughs> who is patsy klein and then he's the one that got me into everybody you know tammy Wynette and george jones oh, all those yeah. people. i'm like oh my god where have i been all my life paint me a picture of your hometown rural most of my family was in the steel mills in the tri-state area of ohio pennsylvania west virginia you could throw a rock to all of them country really sweet people didn't know anybody that was a singer songwriter anything like that my very first people i went and saw in the middle of ohio somewhere i stood outside the bus for the kendall's do you remember the kendall's <laughs> heaven's just to sin away so i stood out there for like 45 minutes to get an autograph so whenever i had some success i never blow anybody off because i'm like that was me there's so many people that were, you know, thank God that they believed. And then I just sort of had actually signed a Christian record deal my uh, senior year of college. I was going to go out to L.A. and it was all set up and everything. I literally had the U-Haul set up and everything like that. And something shady went down and I was just crushed. Take me back to that early time. And I just have a real belief that we all need a champion in our lives. Yes. You had mentioned the school teacher who gave yeah. you the guitar. Yeah. Somebody who says, you know, you're really good at this. You can do this. Was there anybody in your life who's pushed you in that direction? I didn't start till I was 18. I was very, you know, I played trumpet before then. 
And my trumpet story is uh, I went to college thinking I'd be in the jazz band. Because, I mean, I went to this little school. There was 100 people in my class. I can't read music and stuff, but I decided to memorize everything. So, you know, I could play theme to Rocky and all that kind of stuff that we play. <laughs> yeah. So I'm at uh, the uh, audition for the jazz band. And I'm getting my trumpet out and oiling it up and stuff. And then the guy beside me starts playing Flight of the Bumblebee. You know, that's on. <laughs> And I literally put my trumpet in my case, locked it, walked away, and never this played it This is not again. where I belong. I said, I suck. My degree was in uh, social work and criminal justice, which I use every day in the music business, as you know. <laughs> You're damn right you do. <laughs> and uh, so I worked at this residential children's home for, you know, teenagers and stuff like that. And it got down to where the only time they would pay attention was when I was singing. So when the Christian record deal fell through, my parents were like, hey, there's at the Wheeling Jamboree in uh, Wheeling, West Virginia. It's kind of where Brad Paisley's from around. They said they're having a talent contest. Of course, this is before American Idol and all that. And I'm like, well, I'm not that really in the country and stuff. And they're like, what could it hurt? Just go. And my parents are always way behind me. They're like, never get a real job. They're like, whatever you do, just do your best. And, you know, they were totally behind me. So I went and uh, <laughs> swear to God, it was 1984. There were probably 200 girls in the contest. I was at the end of the second day, which wor actually worked out well for me. Everybody sang this song by Deborah Allen called Baby I Lied, which was basically the, you know, Independence Day or the, the big, you know, huge screaming ballad. Or they sang Crazy by Patsy Cline. So I'm sitting there by the end of the third day going, what am I going to do? And I got up and sang Old Chunk of Coal. And I swear the only reason I won the contest was... <laughs> The judges who were snoring at this point after two days of Baby I Lied and the other girl screaming, they went, let her win. She just, <laughs> I don't get what she's saying. She just didn't do crazy or Baby I Lied. Ding, ding, ding. One of the prizes was I got to open at Jamboree in the Hills, which was ended up being a huge music festival. I opened for Reba McIntyre. Oh, my God. And so I asked uh, one of the guys in another band said, you know, you're pretty good. You ought to move to Nashville. And I went, okay. <laughs> Literally. I was like, never even dreamed about it. And then that day, uh, Reba had had her sister singing background at that juncture. And I know she didn't have anybody. So I asked the drummer, I said, how do you audition for Reba? And he totally blew me off. Well, six months later, when I went, okay. And I went to move to Nashville. Guess who's singing background with Reba McIntyre? <laughs> the drummer wasn't her drummer anymore. <laughs> Karen, this is unbelievable. <laughs> Do you believe that sometimes life just opens up these doors for totally. us or, or they're open and you have to recognize them and just keep oh, on yeah. walking through, right? Yeah. How brave do you need to be to do that? Ignorance is bliss, but you know, the people, of course, where I grew up, like I said, pretty country and people say, aren't you afraid to move to Nashville? I went, no, I'm afraid not to. I don't want to end up with three kids in a trailer, but <laughs> I'm you're, terrified, but it could be this bad. <laughs> you're signed to MCA Records and then to Warner Brothers. Everybody writes, everybody plays, everybody sings in this yeah. town. So how did you set yourself apart right away? Well, writing was sort of my secondary goal. And then I got here and it's such a just special community, especially at, at that time. I mean, it was like a college campus. And then I honestly believe either you have the ability or you don't. It's a gift. I mean, I can't brag about anything that's happening because literally it's a gift. Things worked for me very easily, like right away within my first year I got a publishing deal. I got a number one song. I'm like, hey, this is easy. Then the seven years in between. I <laughs> it feels right. So is I what played it feels. a song for Reba. Back then, they would actually have you come in sometimes to just play acoustic guitar. And I played the song and she didn't take the song. But about a week later, I got a call in my apartment. And she goes, hey, this is Reba. And I hung up on her because I thought it was someone jacking with me. And so she calls back. She goes, no, no, it's really Reba. She goes, what are you doing? I went, uh, eking out an existence. <laughs> she says, you want to go to the road with me? And I went, okay. <laughs> like I said, I had to memorize because I don't read music. I had never really been in a band before. And we opened for Alabama at the Pittsburgh Civic Arena, my first show. So the pressure. That's a pretty big yeah. room for your first show, yeah. Karen Staley. So, but oh then I my realized goodness. it was so big that I could probably throw up and die and nobody would nobody notice. Nobody would notice. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about the Bluebird Cafe. Uh, we want to talk about magical places. You are one of the pioneer performers there. Yeah. It was sort of like the Brill Building in New York with, you know, Carol King and Goffin and um, 
Neil Sedaka, Neil Diamond, those guys, you know, it was just the energy. And then, you know, it started out just being a restaurant and then the music started happening. And this is how green I was. I'm telling you, it was just, I just would say yes and worry about being freaked out later. So I got to play the Bluebird with a band the first time. She goes, how much you want to charge? I went, I don't know. I've never charged money before. Think. <laughs> it's green. Talk about a blank slate. Totally. I think when I think about being brave in a situation like this is you just kind of have to be open and just say, OK, yeah, you know, I, I remember someone saying to me, check yes or yes, just say yeah. yes and yeah. then see what happens. Let's talk a little <laughs> bit about the art of songwriting. Yes. It's different for everyone. Yes. How does it work for you? I write pretty fast and I don't have like, you know, mounds of song ideas and stuff like that but then some people go through the the thesaurus and take five years and there's no right or wrong way of doing it you know I self-edit as much as I can I'm as hard on myself as I can be and you know the more you get into it then you realize a little bit more because you know you, you start out like maybe not being as teachable and then you'll go pitch a song by yourself and you're like, dear God, it takes forever to get to the chorus. They were right <laughs> when you're in that situation. Yeah. So, But then what about when you write with other people? Yeah. I would imagine, you know, I'm hearing in Nashville these yeah. last couple of days, I'm hearing a lot about co-writes and writer's yeah. rounds. And do you play well in that sandbox? How, how do you do? I'm very adaptable. So I walk into a situation and I just adapt to it. I don't try to change it. I don't try to whatever. I keep my voice but I just roll with however it's going, you know? And uh, what's funny is Nashville was the very first place where they just hound you about the co-writing, which I never understood because that means your publisher gets half the money. This I don't understand. But it's a blast. It's like dating. Either you have a good time and good chemistry or it's the longest damn day of your life. It's speed dating (laughs) for songwriting, Yeah, right? And there's people that are major hit writers with that you don't maybe have a chemistry with and people who haven't had success yet and and you're like man we are on fire and it's just personality boy it must just be amazing because it's almost like you just never know what's going to happen on that day when you walk into a room Uh well speaking of incredible songs i'm such a fan of so many of your songs let's talk about the story behind Take Me As I Am, Faith Hill's big hit that you wrote. Actually, it came from the weirdest places. And I tell people this, it's like your brain has to be open to what's going on because <laughs> this story, Michael Jackson called his uh, producer at like four in the morning. He's like, I got this idea, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, Michael, can't you wait till the morning? He goes, no, God will give this idea to Prince. <laughs> And it's true. I've been in those situations where like you'll want to write it and then somebody writes it like the next week. You're like, it was literally in the atmosphere or something. It's just weird. And uh, is that what happened with that particular song? I had like this groove going and I went in to write with Bob DePiro, who's a good friend of mine. And we hadn't seen each other for about a year. He went through divorce. We were talking about some other stuff and uh, we couldn't think of anything to write about. So we went to this little coffee shop here called Bongo Java. And I went into the ladies room and there's all this graffiti scratched all over the wall. And one thing literally just lasered out to me and it said, beauty is only a light switch away, which I thought was hilarious. We came back, we laughed and laughed about it. Ironically, the first line of the song is baby don't turn out the lights. So it turned something that funny into something, you know, that meaningful. Wow. And, and- and sometimes you just need that one phrase and yeah. you're, you're off to the races. And yeah, we wrote it in like 45 minutes or something like that. Yeah. She had another hit with one of your songs called Baby Let's Go to Vegas. My favorite line, bet on love and let it ride. Hey, there you go. Tell me about that song. <laughs> you know, it's my lyrics, isn't that sweet? Yes, I do. That was written as a total just kind of joke. This friend of mine had this terrible Elvis impression. He's always going, hey, baby, why don't we get Lisa Marie get in jet? Let's go to Vegas. Come on, baby, come on. <laughs> And so I came home and it actually, uh, props to my friend Jim Photoglow uh, and Vince Melibad, I started playing Fishing in the Dark, you know that song from the Dirt Band? And so somehow I morphed it into whatever I did with uh, Hey Baby Let's Go to Vegas. I wrote that song in 45 minutes and I just thought it was a joke and I played it for my publisher. He goes, you know, it's kind of cool. And then we played it for Faith. And then what did she say? She cut it. She really liked it. And then we were on the road with Alan Jackson at the time, opening for him. 
And so I told her, yeah, you can have it. And then he came and said, I want that song. And I'm like, Uh-oh. oh, dear God. Hey, Alan, why did you try to wrestle that from Faith Hill? Oh. <laughs> so, but I actually did. I mean, it became a single because I basically told her I'd kill her. Because what people don't understand is you have the uh, ability to give a license to the first person who records it. But once it's out on the airwaves or whatever, anybody can do it. They have to pay you theoretically. But if they do it as a polka, you have no control over this. So I told her, I said, you have to put this out because when your album comes out, somebody's going to cut it and it's going to go to 40 with an anchor and I'll kill you. <laughs> so she went with it and she made it to single. So that was pretty cool. And I don't know if Alan was just messing with me to get to her, you know, make faith. She's not, you're not going to give to Alan, are you? Oh my I'm goodness. Like 10 million records or faith, but no. Tracy Bird. Keeper of the Stars. What's funny is I had hits with all those ab- around the same time, within a couple of years. And uh, I wrote Let's Go to Vegas by myself. I wrote Take Me Out of Zane with Bob DePiro. And then it was a three I write with uh, Dickie Lee, who's an iconic songwriter. Wrote She Thinks I Still Care for George Jones and all these people. And uh, Danny Bear Mayo, who's since passed on to the great publisher in the sky. He was an awesome person. So he called me in on this. And I'm like, man, you guys don't need me to, you know, work on this with you. They're like, no, no, we really need your, so thank God they did. And, uh, we wrote it and then we had a specific artist in mind that we wanted to pitch it to. Well, we pitched it to them and they pitched it right back. So I don't know if they ever heard it or not, or they didn't know it was a hit or whatever. So one person wants to cut it. They wanted to change it. And then we didn't want them to. Well, our publisher was pissed. She's like, do you know how hard it is to get a cut period to be picky about it? We're like, I know, man, but and thank God we were all in solidarity about it. So then this guy, Tracy Bird, cuts it. He's no one at the time. He does fantastic. He gets somehow cut from the label. We're like, oh. then this never happens because once the shiny is off the penny of a song, they usually just leave it in the dust. Then he gets picked up by MCA and they record it again, even better. It goes to number one. It's a song of the year. Nails it. But the funniest all full circle moment is when I'm with Faith, she was so generous. She did a costume change in the middle of the show. And she says, well, since this song's a hit, why don't you go out and sing it? I'm like, okay, wow. So I'd sing it every night and go over great. Well, we're over winning for George Strait. The first time I technically meet George Strait, I'm walking off the stage and he looks at me, he goes, he goes, congrats, Karen. He goes, that's a fantastic song. I wish you would have pitched that to me. And I had like blood coming out of my mouth from shutting Mike because I didn't want to disrespect Tracy Birds. I was like, we, I wanted to say, we wrote it for you. Who's the dumbass that didn't play it for you? <laughs> it leads me to my next question. Do you know when it's a hit, Karen? Can you feel it when it's coming out of you? It's funny because I have Shakespeare that I think would be, you know, great. It's got dust on it. And then, hey, baby, let's go to Vegas. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> Who it, knew? It, you know, I mean, I'm yeah. thankful for it, but of it's course. like, yeah, and it's just... You just never know. Yeah. You've toured with Faith Hill, with Reba, with Patti Loveless, with Terry Clark. You're just talking about Alan Jackson. What is that like? You know, people think, oh, that's so glamorous. <laughs> Touring is hard it work. Is. They say, oh, man, you get paid so much for the hour on stage. I went, nope, it's the 23 hours we get paid for being away. And I loved it the first time around. And with even with Faith, I mean, I had... It wasn't like it was roughing it. I was the only other girl, so I had my own room. I had, you know, with Reba, she got another bus. I had the state room in the other bus. I mean, we stayed at the Ritz. We didn't stay at Motel 6, you know, none of this. But to me, and it was wonderful, you know, playing and everything, and I learned so much because I didn't, like I said, come to Nashville having played bars for 10 years. I was total greenhorn. So I learned a lot. It's a blast. It's like perpetual adolescence. <laughs> so I understand why people love it on the road. But I'm a homebody, and I would kiss the ground every time we got home. And uh, just packing and repacking and all that. Everybody else would party all night, and I would get up in the morning and go see the town. So I'm thankful I did that because I actually got to You've see the You've seen a lot of America, we right? Yeah. Who shaped you? Who molded you in terms of those women that you loved? Definitely her, Bonnie Raitt. yes. My parents were cool. They had a lot of different music that they listened to. I grew up on a lot of big band stuff. I love the Andrews Sisters, the McGuire Sisters, Rosemary Clooney, Ugh. and then the country people. I did appreciate them, but not as much as I appreciated them later. 
<laughs> What's your favorite song of all time? And it doesn't need to be the one you've written. There are two songs, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, <gasps> that you know so well. Thank you. My personal favorite, the Eva Cassidy version. And then the other one, It's a Wonderful World. And you're getting teary. Why? <laughs> Why? I'm getting verklempt. Talk amongst yourselves. I like it because it's not sappy. It's deep. To me, those are two gospel songs. In terms of an artist like Faith Hill or Tracy Bird yeah. or any of the other artists who have cut your songs, mm -hmm. when you give your song away mm -hmm. and they breathe life into it and mm -hmm. you hear it, how does that feel? It's interesting. It is. So I've been fortunate that most of the songs that people have recorded them on, they didn't change them that much which was really nice because you get demo envy because really the, the magic happens to me. This is such a huge body of work, Karen, as we come to the end of our time together. And thank you so much for having me here. What are you most proud of? Keeping my voice in my style. I mean, I try to be an authentic in everything I write. You know, you look around this yeah. room, it is just wall to wall <laughs> with gold records and accolades as a singer songwriter bmi you Glory to god it. not me do you feel like a trailblazer how are you feeling about this body of work the thing that i have to say with the god thing is in 30 <clears throat> years of writing i've never had writer's block i mean god gives me something i think just allowing myself to explore all the different things that i do love what does success mean to you it's definitely not the money or fame, neither of which I have anymore. <laughs> I always tell people, here's the song that bought me the house I can't afford to live in anymore. <laughs> my only fear in, is at the end of my life that I won't have used all my gifts that God gave me. I know I've squandered a lot, and that's my biggest regret. The only thing that you really regret when you're older is the things you didn't do. That was the story of my friend and one of the most talented songwriters I've ever had the pleasure of knowing, Karen Staley. Hi, I'm JC Don Valeris, your Music City mentor. I've spent so many hours sitting across from Karen, writing songs, having lunch, and talking about the music business. But there was something so special about sitting in the room listening to her tell her life story as candidly as she did in the interview you just heard. Her story really is remarkable, and yet she remains so humble. When I first moved to Nashville, I was at an event put on by one of my friends, Grammy Award-winning artist Linda Davis. I noticed one of my all-time favorite songwriters sitting across the room. You guessed it, Karen Staley. I walked over to Linda, and I asked if she wouldn't mind introducing me to Karen. Linda graciously agreed. And as I gushed to Karen about my love for her music, I somehow managed to tell her that I was also a writer, and I would love the opportunity to write with her one day. Karen generously handed me her business card, and we remained in touch. A few months later, I was hosting a writer's round at the listening room in Nashville, and I invited Karen to come and perform a few of her songs. Karen said yes, and shortly thereafter, we began writing together. One of the things that I admired the most about Karen was that we had a standing co-write every single Tuesday, and there was never a single time when I sat down with Karen that she didn't have a giant handful of song ideas to be written. Whether it was a hook or a line or a phrase, Karen always came to the table with brilliant and inspiring ideas. Karen told Candy in the interview you just heard that she's never had a case of writer's block, and I can confirm that. But not all of us are as blessed as she is, so it begs the question, what should you do if you get a case of writer's block? It can happen to the best of us, me certainly included. If you're experiencing any form of this, I've got a couple of tricks that I want to share with you today, and they're all really easy. The first idea I have for you is something that I've done for years. Anytime I'm preparing for a week of co-writes and I don't feel like I have enough ideas stocked up in my iPhone, my trick is that I will turn on the TV and flip through channels in hopes that a scene or a piece of dialogue will spark an idea. You'd be surprised how many storylines can inspire a little verse or hook. Take a scenario that is being played out on a TV show or in a movie and write about that. Or maybe there's an actor in a situation with another actor. 
Take the emotion between them and see if you can pull out a song idea from that. My next idea is to draw inspiration from somebody around you. If you're not going through anything right now that might be worthy of a song, think about the people around you. Your friend, a sibling, maybe an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend. Now think about something that they may have just experienced or something that they're currently experiencing. Chances are there will be a song idea in there someplace. If neither of these things are working for you, try picking up a magazine or a newspaper and pull an idea from that. If you don't have a physical copy, Google your local paper or read the headlines of the New York Times. There will almost always be a story that brings a little inspiration your way. The last idea I have for you is to think back on your own life. What have you been through that you think might be worthy of writing about? The best kinds of songs are those we write about from the heart, and having something personal laid out into a song will almost always be relatable to the person listening. Finally, if you've been able to come up with multiple ideas from any of the options I've just given you, make sure to store as many as possible in a very safe place so that you can return to them the next time you're blocked. And if you're having a day where inspiration is coming at you in all directions, make sure to document every single thought, hook, and melody, because the next time writer's block hits you, you'll be able to draw from that. Pretty soon, you'll have ideas flowing out of you like crazy. Another great piece of advice from Music City mentor, J.C. Dawn Valeris. For a free tip sheet on how to get past writer's block, just go to candioterry.com backslash country music podcast. Subscribe to JC's YouTube channel for insights and advice on how to make it in Nashville. If you liked country music success stories, please leave a review and check out our brand new website. You guessed it, countrymusicsuccessstories.com. Follow us on social at Candio Terry and at JC Dawn Valeris. Nashville is pumped about our show. We're getting lots of buzz and more incredible success stories are coming your way. This is Candy O'Terry saying thank you so much for listening to Country Music Success Stories.